I'd like like to just start uh, by thanking those who have turned out here this evening. And uh, history is always a very important part of our lives. And uh, knowing where what we're about, where we come from, helps us to move forward in a little bit of a better way. And it uh, it brings us a better understanding and appreciation for one another. In when I went to university, uh, I did uh, of course a lot of reading, and many of my course subjects were in the area of history and anthropology. So I studied uh, many different cultures, and it's enabled me to broaden my own horizons to appreciate other cultures around the world. And of course, uh, in the process, rub soldier, uh, soldiers, <laughs> rub shoulders with many of my colleagues in the classrooms and uh, got to know quite a few of them. I'd like to start uh, just by stating that the, you know, the Friendship Center in Edmonton, uh, it's uh, been a catalyst for a lot of things in the past. The development of so much. And that is uh, really one of the things that we can credit the Friendship Center movement for. The centers uh, grew up in Canada in a period of time where there was a lot of unrest, socially particularly. Our people, Métis, First Nation and Inuit, were experiencing some pretty tough times back in the 50s and 60s, just when the centers were f firing up. The first center to develop was in Winnipeg, 10 miles away from where I lived, and uh, that was in 1959. In 1960, Vancouver. 1961, Regina. 1962, here. So this was the fourth of what came to be 108 friendship centers across the country. So it was an early bird. And two years after here was when Calgary started up, 1964. And it was uh, the following year, 65, that I got involved with the friendship center movement and never left it. So I've had a pretty long-standing relationship and understand the workings, the different parameters involved in, in the movement. The, uh, the center in Edmonton developed at a time when the Abor Aboriginal community was in a new and exciting time period. It was the era of the hippie movement, complete with bell-bottom trousers, peace symbols, long hair, what have you. It was an exciting time. There was a lot of good music going on, but it was also a time of social unrest. It was a time of the black power movement, particularly in the United States, although there were branches up here. It was also a time of AIM, the American Indian movement, going on. And there was a smattering of that that existed right here in Edmonton. And in fact, some of the members used to frequent the friendship centers. Now, 
Ja. The forerunner of the Friendship Center was actually a small group. There was a small core group that founded the Friendship Center movement. And they, they, there were several of them that were involved. And they used to meet at the home of Mrs. J. D. Sturrock up on 111th Avenue, east of the downtown area. And a key player along with her in this startup was Eddie Belrose, who went on to become a very respected elder and uh, highly involved also with some other things, native communications and so on. Uh, Eddie was the, uh, he, he turned out to become the uh, first vice president for the Friendship Center Society. But the, the center itself was, which started in 62, was preceded in 1960 by the Canadian Native Society. Okay. And it was that group of several individuals who used to meet and plan for the development of what was to become the Friendship Center. There were various reasons for this operation. One of them especially was the fact that there was in this, when we get into the 1960s, you have a much higher movement of Aboriginal people from the reserves and from the Métis settlements and also from other cities migrating here to the point of where there was not just hundreds and thousands of them, but tens of thousands. Uh, in the last estimates that were put forward, the figures would range anywhere from 40 to 60,000 Aboriginals in the city. That, of course, created a lot of pressure on the cities to accommodate the needs of the Aboriginal people. Many came here from very humble beginnings. They came, many came from poor families, by and large. They came from areas where educational services were not the best. They did not have the best of teachers, uh, because the good teachers would stay in the large larger communities and centers. And some of them, for example, were never privy even to certain subjects in the schools that the general population was. So this was going to, of course, turn out to be a real detriment to our native people here in Edmonton. Because if you don't have the proper education, you're not going to get the good jobs. The ones that pay, you know, sufficiently, or what we could say adequately. And uh, many people had low incomes. If you have low incomes, usually your standard of health is lower. Your status out in the community is generally lower. And Discrimination is also something that seeps in with that. Because so many people back in those days used to frown upon people who were not well educated, 
who were not well off. And this, this is a situation that the Friendship Center movement wanted to turn around. They wanted to help the individuals who were moving into the city in various ways. So they started up uh, a whole raft of different programs. And they, they had to start at first with, on, on a real shoestring, believe me. They only had, I remember, when the center here first started, all they had at their office was one chair, one table. That was it. Uh, they had no budget. Their rent, back then, 1962, we're talking about. Their rent, they got a house from the city. And for that house, the rent was $200 a month. Now, of course, you have to put that into context, because we're talking about 1960, not 2015. They went, the core group of individuals went around scrounging some initial capital uh, they didn't really get enough to uh, supply staff, so much what, uh, there was a lot of dependence on volunteers to assist the center. People who weren't working uh, were encouraged to help the center in its duties. Some of the key issues from the outset of the Friendship Center particularly, one was that of alcoholism. Because many of our people that came to the cities having nothing to do, and when you've got free time on your hands, you usually fall into that trap of frequenting the bars, the cafes, the train stations, the bus depots. And there were problems with that too. Because if there was sickness going on, whether it was TB, whether it was a simple thing like the flu or anything like that, those were the places they'd be transferred. The other thing that was really bad about some of those, uh, a huge negative was the scamming and the exploitation that would occur in those places. There were many people who used to frequent the train stations and bus depots just to pick up our women and to either exploit them uh, as street people or to get them dependent on drugs, which they would supply and, of course, expect favors in return. So, Phil Thompson, who was a slavey Indian from a way up north, Assumption, Alberta, so outside of high level, was hired on as the first director of the Friendship Center. So this would have been in the early 60s. He had, he had a very good education behind him. He, he had also been a flight lieutenant in the Air Force. Even after he left the Friendship Center as a staff member. He traveled to many different places, Hobima, Enoch, where he took on major roles. I remember one time meeting him in Calgary when I was working with the Calgary Herald. And uh, he came into the building, we ran into each other, 
And I asked him what he's doing there, and he says, well, he says, our band, which I'm working for as the band manager, he says, we got a major check. And, you know, back in those days, he let me hold it. And I was just shaking. It was 250 grand, you know, quarter million dollars. And back around 1970, that, you know, that was a lot of money. Uh, and uh, I, I didn't even give it second thought in terms of like, just run away and take off with it. <laughs> I thought about that later on and I thought, gee, maybe I should have. <laughs> if I'd have done that, I probably wouldn't be here today. I'd still be stewing in a prison cell. But uh, no, Phil, Phil was a, a real nice guy and he was very dedicated and devoted to any job that he undertook. And he was one heck of a man for the Friendship Center to start off their programming with. He attended to first things first. He knew that alcoholism was a huge problem for our people back in those days. He also knew that the center would never ever survive if it didn't really get off the ground, and particularly in terms of finances. So he went around, he did speaking engagements with clubs, service clubs, organizations, uh, government people, and so on. And within a short time, he had commitments as many as like three dozen commitments for people that were willing to help. And they put up the dollars to maintain the Friendship Center. The Independent Order of Daughters was one that really helped a lot. The Hobima Four Bands helped quite a bit. Uh, I remember they gave an initial $1,000 to the Friendship Center here. Uh, the Mennonite Church gave $100. Enoch gave $100 in those early times. And I'm, I'm speaking of the period like between 1962 and 65. Those were the dawning years, the years in which the Center was struggling and coping to, you know, get themselves off the ground, stabilize, and uh, get some staff people. And little by little, it happened. It was a gradual process, certainly, but uh, one that uh, they came to be quite proud of by the time 1970 rolled around. And by the time they hit the period of the 70s, they were really moving. Uh, they had a lot of programs operating. Uh, I'll just give you a rundown of some of them, for example. This is from the mid-60s, 65 and 6. The membership was helped in the area's employment. 127 people during that one year. Accommodations, five, uh, 55 families. Clothing, 42 families. Food and aid, 80 families. Welfare, 72 families. Education, uh, educational tutoring, uh, 20, 20 students. Court cases, 324. Court appearances, 269. And that again ties in with what I was say, saying earlier about when people are coming in and they're not well off, that's what often happens. You fall in to the 
scene of crime and or alcohol or drugs. Uh, emergency trips, 249. Emergency meals in bed, 347. Referrals, 652. And last but not least, of course, the never-ending telephone calls, 10,000 plus. So, but the centers over time took shifts in their direction. So, for example, alcoholism, which was a huge problem back in the 60s and 70s, lessened as the years went by. People started attending AA. In fact, the center started its own program that was, you know, it was built on the design of the AA movement. And it was called the Tuau Group. Tuau meaning welcome. The, uh, so it was their own version. It was the center's own version of AA. And people would go to that rather than go to the AA because there was better understanding of just where our people come from and what they always had to deal with. And in that Tuau group, we had our own people serving the needs of our people, which, and because of that, there was a better relationship that existed and the chances of turning your life around from alcoholism was heightened all the more. And it proved itself to happen. And over time, of course, people involved in the Friendship Center movement moved on. What I said earlier about the Friendship Center being a catalyst that was one of the things that was so positive about the center because it set the stage, if you will, for the development of these other bodies, these other groups and organizations to spring forward. Native housing through Canative housing, Native outreach for Native employment services, you know, Native counseling services of Alberta to deal with court and uh, legal matters and provide legal advice to their people. Sometimes they, uh, lawyers and business people would be brought in and give, deliver lectures to the membership to help them better understand what it is they're involved with in city life here. Uh, the list goes on and on in terms of programs that operated through the Friendship Center. In uh, right now, for example, there's far less that is happening in the area of sports and recreation because of the absence of proper facilities. In 2010, the Friendship Center here sold its building uh, for reasons that they put forward, uh, such as uh, overhead costs being far too high to continue maintaining the building in a fashion where the center uh, you know, he said the center was going to go broke if they continued to stay in that building. The old church uh, used, uh, it was what they called the people's church in this day. Uh, so that was in 2010. Since 2010, that's five years now, 
close to six. And throughout that time, it has not yet had a good alternate from which to operate. The, they've been in two different spaces that they've rented. The first one was very small was in the old offices in the West End that uh, had been occupied by the native newspaper, Windspeaker and Sweetgrass. And space there was extremely limited. Now they're on 95th Street between 117th and 118th Avenue, next door to the Métis Regional Office. And that building also has its limitations. Okay? So the main floor is mainly some office space, uh, a small, you know, a small meeting room that uh, doubles for their board meetings. And then they've got an open area upstairs, maybe kind of about the size of this room. So you can appreciate that they can't really host programs that they had before, whether those were sports or social activities. The center was notorious for hosting round dances, uh, sports tournaments, volleyball, basketball, floor hockey. Uh, in the Previous years, uh, the 70s and 80s, uh, they used to also have boxing ring. In fact, one of the special visitors, when they had the boxing ring going, uh, was none other than former world champion Joe Frazier. And of course, all the uh, Canadians were uh, The Canadian boxers of note, many of them dropped into the center from time to time. When Willie DeWitt, who became Canadian champion, a fellow from Grand Prairie, when he was here in the city, he used to work out at the Friendship Center gym when he was 17 years old. And he used to pack rocks on his back to toughen up his muscles his back muscles, his legs. But uh, Gordon Russell started with the Friendship Center in 1972. And he was a fellow that was going to help bring many of our young native athletes to rise and shine. There were guys like Guy Boutin, who went on to become a Canadian champion, Randy Jackson, and another one was a, a, a prudent boy. And two of those three, all of them were Golden Gloves champions, but two of them also became Canadian champions in their weight classes. One was, Bel uh, one was a Bantam weight, and I can't remember the other one, but uh, they did well under the tutelage of Gordon Russell. So Gordon Russell became something of an icon in circles. In fact, his boxing club called the Native Boys Boxing Club was known all across this country because of the talent that he brought out with our young native lads. But Gordon instructed more than just boxing. He did a lot in the way of these kids feeling good about themselves, having a good self-image. And uh, that's so critical with our young people as they grow up. And that's just another thing that I've always really appreciated 
in the Friendship Center movement is their focus on the youth. Because those are the people that are going to be out there making decisions, some of which could affect our own futures. So it's important for them to grow up as good, strong individuals with uh, good ethics, integrity, honesty, respectful, all the different things that sports development employs with their clientele. And anybody who's doing a job of managing and or coaching in the area of sports knows that for a fact. Uh, the centers were fortunate that while they were still young, including the one here, they were recognized by the various government bodies, all three levels, civic, provincial, federal. So they got some of their funding through all uh, three levels. And the department that uh, initially provided finances for uh, the Friendship Center movement here was the Secretary of State. Over time, that changed, you know, uh, because the government now has a minister that's responsible for things such as sports and recreation and health, health and wellness. So falls in those categories as well. But it's been a real, uh, you know, it's been a real roller coaster. And the center is just like any other organization. It has its ups and downs. It has its roller coaster rides, you know. And there are times when uh, I know, like, like I say, I myself have been involved directly as a staff member, as a board member, and as a volunteer with the Friendship Center movements since the mid-60s. And it never fails at some time, at some point, you're going to have infighting going on. People who are vying for positions on the board. People who are vying for positions on staff. Uh, people who want certain favors from the Friendship Center. Like, I, I could go on and on telling you stories about individuals who have scammed the Friendship Center movement, taken advantage of their positions from within for the good of themselves rather than the good of the people that the center is supposed to be serving, you know, and uh, that's pretty sad. I remember uh, one instance where we had we had several deer hides come in. They were already tanned and they were beautiful. And uh, one of the people that intervened with the, and took possession of those hides when they had no right to, and took them home, and was going to use them for themselves, for making of crafts. Oh, man. I mean, who does that impact? You know, it's the kids that suffer that loss of those materials. So because those hides were gone, the youth weren't able to learn the craft make, making that those were intended for. And uh, this person was in a very high position 
at the Friendship Center. But I went after that individual. It took me quite a while, but I finally got those hides returned. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't care whether they hated me for it or not, because to me, I was just doing what I should be doing, righting the wrong. And uh, it's just unfortunate that, but we have, we have bad people in all societies. It doesn't matter which culture we come from. You know, you're always going to run across them. But when you know that you are in the right, never be afraid to confront an issue like that. Because what can they do to you? Especially when they know that you're right. They'll already be, you know, feeling themselves the guilt of what they did because they know that they were wrong. You know. So I'm not saying corruption is rampant <laughs> in the Friendship Center movement, no. But I'm saying sometimes these things happen. That's to be expected and uh, deal with it as you can. But at any rate, the, uh, the centers uh, here had a pretty glorious time. Clarence Phillips, Clarence Longmore, Gordon Russell, and then some other people, they were on staff, okay? And they really helped the Friendship Center sports program move along. Oh, one other. And he's still with us today, Lloyd Ogier. Uh, his health is not the greatest, but he too used to coach some of the sports teams. Uh, the, the teams did very well. Even Willie Littlechild, who became member of parliament and one of the commissioners for the Truth and Reconciliation. Uh, Willie attended university here, and while he did that, he used to frequent the Friendship Center as well. And he got a hockey team started up that did pretty good. There were some of these ladies, the girls and the boys basketball team, uh, not so much basketball, but uh, volleyball. Volleyball and baseball. They did really well. Uh, the, the, male, the male baseball team went right to the interprovincial championships as finalists. The girls, 1981, 82, 85, won the National Indian Athletic Association Championships. So that was a real feather in the cap of the Friendship Center here to do that. Uh, I remember uh, this one gal, she was involved with us on our board when we started up the uh, movement that created the North American Indigenous Games in 1990 and is still running today. This one gal, she was from the Mady settlement east of here. And I'll tell you, that gal, I would never have wanted to wrestle with her, even arm wrestle. She was like just solid. You know, you talk about being like a two by four or a four by four. She had it all. She had the power and the strength. And she had the personality that went with it too. Very, very nice individual. But uh, there were a lot of people in, uh, in sports that turned out to be very good, personable individuals. 
many of them gave back to the Friendship Center after they, their years were done in the area of sports uh, by volunteering their services. I remember, for example, 1987, there was a young man, well, he wasn't so young, I guess, by my standards, he was young. He was, he was in his 40s. And uh, he did a run, a marathon from here, starting off from Fort Edmonton Park, all the way to New York City to retrieve, or to attempt to retrieve, a sacred First Nations object from the museum there. And uh, as, a, as a youngster, he used to box. And he himself had been a Golden Gloves champion. And that fellow, I really felt for him because, you know, but at least he made the effort. That run all the way to New York City which they did in stages and through the, through the most trying time of the year, winter, <laughs> you know, because they took off in the fall and they arrived in New York in the spring. So there was a lot of cold days on that run. And can you just imagine him tripping through places like Manitoba and Ontario, which has some pretty cold winters? You know, and I know uh, uh, trying to remember the name Billy Mills, the Olympian, the first American to win the ten thousand meters. A native boy. I remember asking him uh, if he would help us out with that run by contributing whatever he could. And so what he arranged for was some of the footwear, the running shoes that the boys needed. Because this fellow that made the run, Jim, Jim Thunder was his name. Uh, the late Jim Thunder passed away here a few years ago. Uh, he was not the only one that made the run. There was, at any given time, there was usually four runners. And they would work in relays on that run. But they did, they did run all the way. Um, so it was nice that Billy Mills was able to help out in that manner. And, uh, when Jim eventually got back to Alberta here, he took up the gloves again, mind you, not as a competitor, but as an instructor. Okay? And he mentored our young kids at the, the last large friendship center that we had here, which uh, was on 101st Street and 112th Avenue. Just uh, mentioning the buildings of the Friendship Center, the very first building, the, that house that uh, the center rented in 1962, which was the year that the Friendship Center formed, uh, that house they rented from the city was at 102, 18, 108th Street. Oh, those of you that know Edmonton can just picture that area. You know where that sits, eh? That's right across the street from present day Northwest College. There used to be, it's no longer there, there, there used to be a, a car wash 
on that northwest corner of that intersection, 102nd Avenue and 108th Street. And that's where this two-story clapboard building was that the center first rented. That was their first home. And that was the thing that troubled the people that originated the Friendship Center movement also in the early going was how come all these other ethnic groups in the city, you know, the German Canadians, the Ukrainian Canadians, the Chinese Canadians, all these different ethnic groups, they all had their own community halls or structures, whatever they were, and yet there was nothing for our Aboriginal community. So and that, that was why they banded together and decided to, to do something. Uh, well, that and, of course, the ultimate objective, which was to help meet the needs of the urban people living in and migrating to the city of Edmonton. And uh, we had uh, individuals, uh, another guy that boxed, he was a northerner from, from the Arctic, actually. And some of you might remember his name, because he also sat on city council. This fellow was, went by the name of Dave Ward. Okay? He was an Inuit. He was a lawyer. One of the early batches of Aboriginal lawyers in this country. So we had people like that who associated themselves quite a lot with the Friendship Center movement and went on to things like city council, among other things. We have many, many people now who go through the Friendship Centers who are in higher education, getting not just a bachelor's degree, but masters and PhDs. You wouldn't believe the number who are now going in for their doctorates. There's quite a few. And when the center uh, first took root in the, the early stages, in the 60s too, that was one of the other things that they did was they, uh, they helped tutor some of the students who really needed it. You know, that was a time when, when we talk about the 60s and 70s, we didn't have a, a lot of people, never mind college or university, we didn't have that many people who were even finishing grade school. Most of our people back in those days if they were fortunate enough, got a grade seven or eight education. There were many, including Stan Daniels, who became the provincial Métis Association president for a number of years. He only had around a grade four education. I remember when I lived in Winnipeg, the mayor there for 25 years, Stephen Juba, he only had a grade three education, you know. But uh, that's a pat on the back for them, for sure. But it shows you what people can do when they set their mind to it. And that education isn't always the wherewithal for success in a career. The center movement, there's one part of business that uh, also warrants a bit of a pat on the back for them. 
And that's the whole thing of reporting. Because for a lot of organizations, whether they're native or otherwise, one of the weaknesses of so many organizations has been their failure to report or to adequately report at the end of their fiscal years. And particularly accountability for their funding. But it's an area that the center has always had a pretty good focus. So that seldom was there really anything in the way of ripoffs of the center from within. And uh, that kind of goes to their credit uh, in terms of, I, I know that uh, the late Donna Woodward, who was met for many years the financial controller of the Friendship Center here, uh, that gal, she, she just did a, you know, amazing job. And it was people like her who helped keep the Friendship Center alive because, again, you know, what organization is going to stay on its feet if they don't have funding? And the Métis Association, as an, as an example of today also, has been keeping very stable financially because the person that's, that's been in the position of president now for over 10 years was formerly their financial controller, you know? So she knew all the hoops to jump through to get funding and to also account for their expenditures. And so it was with the Friendship Center movement just like the Métis Association, uh, because Donna Woodward knew what it was all about and knew how to do it properly and keep transparent and be accountable for those dollars and cents. The center um, continues to be funded uh, through the federal government and uh, kind of indirectly in a way. So the funding today flows, the centers in Alberta get their approval from the provincial Friendship Center office, who in turn receives theirs from the National Friendship Center Association. Okay. So it's no longer a case as it was in the early days where funding flowed from Secretary of State directly to your Friendship Center. So that's really changed over the years. And uh, I mean, who knows whether it's going to remain that way? Who knows whether government itself will continue to fund friendship centers? And I think the day that if and when it arrives, that they discontinue, I think that will be a sad day. Unless the centers are able to put in place programming that will see them become self-sufficient. And there are some ways that that could be done. I'm, you know, I'm not going to explore those here and now, not today, but uh, it's, it's certainly food for thought, I would think, for the friendship centers. And I know that at the through my own experience at the board level, because I sat for a number of years here 
on the executive committee, usually as the vice president or the secretary of the board for the Friendship Center here. And uh, some of us have discussed the possibility of that happening someday and that we should be giving it perhaps some thought how we could counter, you know, the loss of that kind of income. Because what are you going to do then if it all of a sudden falls in your lap? So I, I, I really think it is something that uh, Friendship Center should give thought to, uh, you know, a little, little more than they have. You get caught up sometimes, too, in the politics of things. I know there was a period here with the Friendship Center where there was an overabundance of concentration on governance, you know. And it's fine and dandy, but you know, you can't beat a lot of the old traditional values of organization, organizational operations in a traditional fashion. You know, even things, simple things like, and some of the centers are taking this on nowadays, the whole thing of decision-making through consensus rather than voting. You know, just going by general consensus don't have to go through all the stuff of raising hands or passing out slips of paper all the time for people to vote yay or nay or abstain, whichever. As for membership, at any given time, the Friendship Center membership list usually hovers anywhere from 300, roughly 300 to 450. Uh, that might not seem an awful lot in terms of the population figure, but uh, I wonder what it would be with the, many of the other ethnic organizations in this city. I don't think they do too badly. Now the, uh, just a few other things on, as I mentioned with the focus initially being largely in the area of sports, recreation, and alcohol treatment, court workers, because there has been less, re you know, well, the picture really changed in the 1970s when Native Counseling Services sprang up in terms of uh, court workers and alcoholism because you had pound makers and Nietzsche, which worked in the area of treatment for addictions, and you had Native Counseling Services, which worked with court situations. And that meant much less of a burden, of course, on Friendship Center staff and operations. And, of course, their finances, too, because they didn't have to hire people for those positions. That was the beauty of that. You had these Native Housing Programs develop. So that took another burden 
off their shoulders. Um, and that meant that they could direct their attention to other areas as required. So now, for example, a lot of the focus is on social programs, some somewhat in recreation, although there again, like I say, it's limited because they lack adequate facilities. And it's hard to get other places out there. And that was my real fear when we left what used to be that former People's Church building on 101st Street, just north of downtown here, because I knew myself that if they let that building go, they're going to have a lot of trouble getting alternate facilities because there's a lot of pressure on other space. So if you want to hold sports programs, whatever it is, the availability of facilities for that is, you know, minimal. And then you have all these other large gatherings. I mean, you look at the programs the center operated through the years. You have Thanksgiving banquet. You need a large gymnasium for that. You have your sports activities, floor hockey, basketball, volleyball, uh, tennis, ping pong, uh, those ones, shuffleboard. Uh, some, they did have a pool table at one time, no, no longer. Uh, but you have other things too. You have Mother's Day tea, Father's Day tea. You have Heritage Day celebrations. You have Christmas party for the kids and for the adults. You have... Uh, Sometimes they'd have Remembrance Day services. They'd have funerals, wakes, weddings, round dances, powwow practice. Uh, and, uh, you know, in addition to these annual large gatherings that they could host because they had the facilities to do it, you had outside groups from the Aboriginal community that used to rent the facility as well for their purposes. So it served, it filled a need there as well. Now, today, they can't do that because they still have not replaced that structure that they were in five years ago. So it's a bit of a sad commentary. Uh, the one bright light is the fact that they do have money sitting in the bank from the sale of that building with which to purchase, to build from scratch, whatever, a new center. And... Uh, Personally speaking, I would love to see Edmonton come forward with a plan that would help the Friendship Center develop a center of its own design with the land being provided, say, by the city for a token $1 sale tag. <laughs> Other cities have done it, and there's no reason Edmonton couldn't do it. You know, uh, they've not had a great deal of uh, financial help from the city, and if they could get even that chunk of land, that would solve a lot of the problem right there. You know, they got all this. They're starting to do all kinds of developments here in the River Valley. 
Why not give a piece of that? You know, and make it a state of art building too. You know, the uh, there are some friendship centers in North America, both Canada and the U.S., where they've done all kinds of Aboriginal art design to the building and made it a tourist attraction. And if centers did that and got back into retail sales again of things like arts and crafts, even meals, there's, there are a number of centers that do that. They provide meals and, uh, you know, they make some of their income in that manner also. And at the same time, they're providing employment for those people from our communities. So there are ways and means. Uh, I think we're just about at eight.